While arguing, people often cite statistics hoping to provide meaningful evidence for their positions. Sometimes, when enough factors are accounted for and the subject matter lends itself to it, statistical evidence can be particularly strong, but in many cases it's remarkably weak. Let's explore why that is, especially in the case of human or social issues, specifically when you hear numbers thrown around in arguments about education. Usually, either side of an issue, pretty much any issue, can find some stats that seem to tilt the argument in either one's favor. That can happen because even though the numbers themselves may be 100% accurate, it's the information that's not included or considered that makes them so hollow. A statistic used to prove a point often functions as a mini post hoc fallacy, meaning it supposes a faulty causal relationship. This occurs through ignoring, either intentionally or just not noticing, multiple other factors that impact the statistic apart from the factor it does call attention to. There may be some other factor that was a massive impact on the matter that just got completely unmentioned, or over 9,000 unmentioned factors that all have small impacts but have a collectively significant difference that they make. For example, when Michael Jordan played for the Chicago Bulls, he averaged about 30 points per game, and when he played for the Washington Wizards, he averaged about 21.5 points per game. Someone may cite these figures and conclude that playing for Washington made him a worse player, or that living in Illinois made him a better player. But these conclusions, while they do correlate with the numbers, ignore tons of other significant variables that likely contributed to the cause of his decreased point production like Jordan playing for the Bulls when he was 21 through 34, except that baseball year, and playing for the Wizards when he was 38 to 40. He was a shooting guard for the Bulls and a small forward for the Wizards. He had different teammates on each team and dozens of factors that contributed to scoring fewer points. Using that figure to alone conclude that he was a worse player with the Wizards based on those stats would be failing to consider all the other tangible statistics beyond points let alone the factors that aren't statistically measurable. Now, this doesn't mean that the stat itself is wrong, nor that MJ wasn't a better player on the Bulls. The numbers are accurate, and most would agree MJ's prime was in Chicago, but you can see how soundbite statistics, while accurate, can be thrown out without careful context to conclude things that may seem related but could have zero causal connection to the stated conclusion if deconstructed carefully. To understand this problem better, let's look at how statistics are used to reach the most reliable conclusions with some very elementary science. Scientists are particularly strong at applying statistics to conclusions of experiments because they almost obsessively search out all the outside factors or variables that could impact their studies. Say we want to reliably determine the impact of different fertilizers on plants. An experiment needs to account for as many variables as possible, and ideally, the only thing that varies in every single experiment will be the fertilizer used. The first ultra-smart, essential, super-scientific step is to establish a control or baseline. This can be done at the fifth grade science fair level, so let's keep it that simple. Little Susie wants to set up a control, so she plants a teaspoon of Kentucky bluegrass seeds half an inch deep into one cup of completely ordinary topsoil from her backyard. She's going to place it beside her bedroom window and provide it with two tablespoons of tap water once per day. She'll grow them in the styrofoam cup because she doesn't happen to care about the environment just yet. She's 10. Give her a break. Notice that in that control, she's already recorded several potential variables to account for. The type and quantity of soil, plant seeds, and water, the location for sunlight exposure, the depth of the seeds, and the container type being used. Could there be even more variables to consider? Sure, but she's doing pretty well for a fifth grade kid. Now, Susie needs to determine what measurable qualities she will be comparing among her control grass cup with the fertilized grass cups. Greenness is tough to objectively measure, so she may use something like the average length and width of the five tallest blades of grass in each cup. Let's say she's testing three types of fertilizer. She now has to actually conduct the experiment by planting not only her control cup, but three other cups using all of the exact same conditions the soil, water, seeds, seed depth, container type, and location, they all have to be as close to exactly the same as the control as possible in order to justifiably conclude that any changes noted are most likely caused by the independent variable she introduces, which is fertilizer.
So she applies a uniform amount of fertilizer in a uniform way to the other three cups and measures their growth progress once a week for two months along with the control. It's tedious and involves a lot of number recording so Susie's data can be evaluated and presented with honest and meaningful correlations between the fertilizer being applied to the growth of the grass noted. So it took some thought to rule out reasonable variables that may affect the result, yet some variables are impossible to remove. Even if the grass seeds came from the same packet, they're still different seeds. Ideally, you'd use the exact same seed to compare its growth under four different conditions, only changing the independent variable at the same time in the same place. Unfortunately, it's impossible for the same exact seed to germinate four times, let alone in the exact same place simultaneously. Even if all four cups are beside the window, they're still in slightly different locations, and that has to be taken into account on a micro level. Now, we're still working with grass growth here, so it's still fairly observable, reliable as a first experiment. As long as you only draw conclusions from it that deal with the average blade size of Kentucky bluegrass. It should be clear why introducing large groups of human beings into statistical information can neglect to consider many of the variables involved with that. When people try to bring up the efficacy of education, they're dealing with the human mind, a remarkably complex organ, and the amount of knowledge learned is currently fairly an intangible thing which we attempt to make tangible for the sake of statistics. We do that so we can evaluate teachers and students and schools with a hard number to represent something that's really conceptual and impossible to accurately quantify right now. The only things that are used by states and in statistics for that quality of education, apart from graduation rates, tends to be standardized test results. ACTs, SATs, or any of the unique acronyms states use for standardized tests that they each mandate. Using test data assumes a lot of things. It assumes the students can actually understand the vocabulary and the questions. Not the content, but the questions themselves in the way that they're being asked. Thousands of kids get questions wrong that they could have gotten right if they had the background vocabulary to understand what the hell they were being asked. It assumes every teacher of every student has had time to cover every part of the curriculum with sufficient depth, requiring moving at a steady pace through the material no matter how many students didn't master the previously covered content and needed more time with it. It assumes all students taking these tests actually do their best to pass them. In my experience with students in poverty, many explicitly express absolutely no concern for those tests, even if graduation or potential college acceptance is contingent on them. A surprising number of students have told me that they don't care if they graduate or when because after school they're just going to go work for their uncle's shop or sell drugs to make money and they don't need diplomas for that. If they're in school until they're 20, that's just two more years of free breakfast and lunch. Now, the cultural implications and causes of that attitude are worth devoting an entirely different video to discuss. The important thing to understand here is that such human behaviors aren't factored into disaggregating the data that comes from standardized test scores. The same test goes to the students who are from schools in different places, with different funding, social issues, geographical challenges, populations, to kids coming from different socioeconomic statuses, ethnic and regional cultures, and radically different home lives, and parenting techniques. Also, the fact that Test scores are used to evaluate both the quality of teachers who teach the curriculum and the students responsible for learning it is already a contradiction. It's admitting that there are at least two independent variables in this experiment which directly affect the data for each other. All those variables are just a fraction of the problem with the measuring component of the experiments used to measure school, teacher, and student quality. It would be like Susie having that many problems just with the measuring of her grass growth. So many factors go unconsidered, causing opinions based on shallow information. People like Ron Paul and John Stossel cite statistics that private schools score higher on standardized tests than public schools to conclude it would be best to abolish public schools and privatize all education. That assumes not only that test scores correlate with quality education, but that school is the only variable in the equation. So all of those students who were struggling in a public school, if you threw them into a private school, they'd automatically be better because that's the only factor. Um, when I recently stated that gender segregated schools and co-ed schools have pros and cons, but no massive superiority is shown in either in one of my videos, someone responded with the video offering the following statistics as evidence for segregated schools being better. 
The data shows the FCAT score performances in which boys and girls in co-ed classes scored proficiently at rates of 37 and 59% respectively. In single gender classes, 75% of girls scored proficient while 86% of boys did. It sounds like a knockout argument based on the numbers, but in this case and the private schools case, there are so many other things to consider. First, private schools decide who they allow to attend. They can screen enrollment from admission tests, applications, and interviews to determine if you're academically strong enough for them. If you don't score high enough on those, then they can reject you and you're therefore not part of their data. If your academic performance or behavior simply become unacceptable and doesn't show enough improvement, they can stop accepting your payments and kick you out just like a college can. Public schools have no such luxury. Short of expulsion and provision of homebound services, which often involve legal conflicts and expenses that school districts can't afford, they have to educate everyone who wishes to enroll there, not just those affluent or fortunate enough to be able to pay for school, meet entrance test standards, and consistently behave. For the record, this is not a knock on private schools themselves. They and their educators have unique challenges of their own and they uh, have to deal with them and they work hard to do so. But it should be clear that these factors significantly influence test performance statistics. I've yet to meet a teacher who's taught in both private and public school systems who doesn't agree with that. Now, public school figures include the lowest level of students from those whose parents couldn't or wouldn't pay for them to go to school, even if it only cost them $10 a month, uh, and some who consistently behaved with issues that stem from various environmental influences beyond the school itself. When the school disciplines such a student with removal from class, that kid is coming back, and now he or she is X number of days behind in the instruction with an angry attitude, and that kid's test scores still count. When you look at the co-ed versus single gender class stats, uh, you have to understand that the vast majority of single sex classes come from private schools, while nearly every public school is co-ed. On top of that, the statistics come with the performances of entirely different students. And these specific stats mentioned consider the FCAT, which is Florida's standardized test. So in addition to this data being invalid to draw that conclusion from, it only represents one of 50 states anyway. Again, you can't grow the same seed in multiple places at once, and that makes these stats even less reliable. Ideally, you would be comparing Group A's performance under Condition X to Group A's performance under Condition Y to conclude that the condition had the impact. That's not happening here. There is no control group to be compared to, and these statistics are comparing Group A's performance, again, not on a reliable data source, under Condition X to Group A's B's performance under condition Y. It's impossible to have the same all-boy class and all-girl class take the same course again, take the same test a second time, and receive a valid data sample to compare to when they took it separately, or to do that in the opposite order. They're also being taught by different teachers who are equally certified to teach in the same state, but use different methods and have different levels of efficacy with different student personalities. So, using these kids' test scores as statistics to judge education quality would be comparable to Billy conducting Susie's same experiment, but his four cups look rather different. One is in a styrofoam cup, one's in a Dixie cup, one's in a plastic cup, and one of them is in a big-ass terracotta pot to which Martha Stewart would give an affectionate nod of approval. One cup contains topsoil, one sand, one is nothing but fertilizer, one is gravel. Two get tap water, one gets filtered water, and one gets polluted water, and they all get different arbitrary quantities thereof. One is beside a window, one's outside, one's on the kitchen table, and the other is in Billy's closet. All the seeds are buried at varying depths, and three of them are using different types of grass. The fourth one isn't even grass. It's a watermelon plant. Billy determines that even though his ruler was broken in half and he taped it back together haphazardly, his data is completely fair and reliable because they all got measured with the same broken ruler. Be careful about when you use and how much you trust statistics. There's a reason we can't understand Michael Jordan's greatness just by looking at a box score of his career averages. Numbers alone can rarely tell the whole story.